good or is it uh... it's good boss okay thank you john okay good morning everyone uh, thank you for joining class the last day of this uh, week uh, before we begin class can i ask uh, isaac Wendy, to uh, lead us in prayer, please. Okay, let us pray. Father, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who come before you this morning, we want to thank you for everything you are doing and you are going to do for us. We thank God for our lecturers. We thank God for all our classmates for making us meet today to listen to your words. We want to ask that your grace may cover us as we continue to go through the course. Let the Holy Spirit impact your word. And let the word be a fruit in our lives so that we can be a good example to others. We thank you for everything in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Um, on Wednesday, we began looking at chapter 7, uh, the doctrine of uh, redemption. Uh, and the doctrine of justification and sanctification. So on Wednesday, we looked at what redemption means and uh, uh, to get a whole idea of this word redeem, uh, redeeming, uh, redemption, uh, we looked at um, uh, various Greek words um, as mentioned in the verses in the Bible and scripture. And we try to understand or get a better understanding of what uh, the doctrine of redemption is. And we also looked at what we are redeemed from and uh, what are the benefits of redemption. Today we look at uh, the doctrine of uh, justification and sanctification. Uh, so what do you understand by this term or this word justification? What do you understand by the word justify, justification? Justification, as you come to understand, is like when you are accused and brought before the court of law, just for an example. And then in the cause of justice, the, the judge says you are acquitted, you are declared free. You, you are not guilty as charged. You are set free. So justification is like Jesus redeeming us from the wages of sin. That's my understanding. Thank you, Isaac. Uh, good understanding, a good example as well. Uh, the courtroom where, uh, you know, uh, this, uh, the person who is... Uh, uh, convicted of doing something that is wrong, uh, is uh, justified, is pronounced uh, not guilty and set free. Uh, Subashi says uh, uh, someone whose uh, uh, justification means uh, declared righteous. Thank you. Uh, yes, Lubega, you had your hand up. Biblical justification means we were guilty of sin and uh, an innocent being jesus christ after being convicted for death he came in and said no let me take up the position of the sinner and he was killed on our part or he was uh, crucified for our own sins so this is this is how i take it we were already guilty by the sin of one man adam so we all were supposed to be to get our penalty, which was death. But an innocent man came and said, instead of Collins, instead of John, instead of who to be killed, let me offer my innocence. And the court was accepted and he was killed on our behalf. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you uh, for that good uh, uh, explanation. Yes, we were uh, sinful, we are guilty, uh, but Jesus, the righteous one, the sinless one, uh, died in our place um, and took on our guilt, our punishment, uh, and hence we were pronounced as not guilty, as uh, someone who's innocent, completely forgiven, uh, and declared uh, righteous. 
yes, in the courtroom of God, we are standing as now as people who are justified because of uh, the righteousness of uh, Jesus Christ, because he took our uh, punishment, he took our place, and hence we are justified. Thank you for that uh, good detailed explanation. Anyone else wants to add to what Isaac and Lubega said? Uh, Subhashi said, uh, declared righteous. So what does righteous mean? Oh, Ma'am, uh, justification biblically means like when God forgives, he justifies us like um, uh, as if we have not sinned. Yeah, as if we have not sinned, never sinned. Thank you, Rosalyn, for that uh, explanation. Uh, yes, it's true that, uh, you know, because of what Christ did for us on our behalf, uh, now we stand justified in the presence of God, in the courtroom of God, so to say. Uh, we stand in his presence uh, and God sees us just as if we have never sinned. And it's because of uh, what Christ has done for us and because of his righteousness. Uh, so what does, thank you, Rosalind, for that good explanation. Uh, what does righteousness mean? Right stand with God. Thank you, John. Yes, uh, righteousness means that we have a right standing with God, uh, that uh, we are able to relate to God. Uh, just like Adam and Eve had a right standing with God when they were created, but when they sinned, they became enemies of God. They lost their standing with God. But now we have a right standing with God. And uh, once we believe Jesus Christ is our personal Savior, uh, the Word of God says in Ephesians that we are seated in heavenly realms. That is our uh, standing. A standing is that we are, uh, uh, you know, uh, made righteous or right in God's sight with no uh, free from guilt, free from all sin. Uh, right also means that we belonged to or belong now to uh, God's family. We are uh, sons and daughters. Um, and also right standing means that, uh, you know, we are uh, not seen as enemies of God, but we are now friends of God. Thank you all for your valuable inputs. Appreciate that. Um, so justified basically means uh, that, uh, like Isaac said, you know, we are in a courtroom and we are um, seen as sinners. But uh, because of what Jesus has done, we are declared as uh, acquitted. Uh, we are declared not uh, guilty. We are completely forgiven. Uh, we are made innocent and made just as if we have never sinned. Okay, isn't that wonderful that uh, the moment we accept Jesus as our Lord and our Savior, uh, that we are acquitted, we are declared not guilty, we are completely forgiven, uh, made innocent, uh, made just as if I never sinned. Uh, just imagine you standing in that box uh, where you know you are guilty of what you have done, uh, guilty of some wrongdoing, uh, and you deserve the punishment, and you are so frightened whether, you know, I mean, of course, you're going into prison, or it can be lifetime, or it can be a death sentence that you have to face. Just imagine the the anxiety, imagine the, uh, the shame, imagine the pain that you're going through, and suddenly the judge pronounces you as not guilty, you know? Uh, that is the extent of, uh, uh, of the love of God the Father. Uh, that is such a great sacrifice that Jesus has made on our behalf. So uh, the next time, you know, we um, want to give in to our, uh, our sinful, lustful passions or uh, desires or want to feed our carnal nature, uh, we need to always remember this, you know, where we stand, where we were standing where we stand now, you know, we were standing as sinners, but now we are standing, uh, you know, at the right hand of God. We are seated in heavenly places. Uh, that is our standing. That is our position. And uh, we never want to uh, bring disgrace or shame or pain uh, to the one who has, uh, uh, you know, who has uh, planned this for us and the one who sacrificed this for us. Um, 
and it says, uh, you know, don't grieve the Holy Spirit, Ephesians chapter 4. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit that is in you, okay? So justification is an instantaneous uh, legal act. It's instantaneous mean, means it happens the very moment uh, we just accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, that very moment, that very instant uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, we are considered by God as, uh, you know, forgiven of our sins um, and Christ's righteousness belongs to us. God declares us righteous in his sight. So uh, justification as is an instantaneous legal act. It's legal because it's lawful. According to the law, we stand condemned as sinners. Uh, the 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 uh, the the verdict has already been passed death sentence uh, but you know because of what Christ has done he took our place so it's an instantaneous legal act which means it's lawful it's an authorized act in which God considers our sins as forgiven and Christ's uh, righteousness as belonging to us and we also uh, know that. Uh, uh, justification is when God declares us righteous in his sight. That means we are right with him. We are no more seen as enemies or no more seen as uh, sinners. Okay. In Romans chapter 4, verse 5, we read that God justifies a sinner who repents, uh, not by excusing their sin or denying they are sinners, but by pardoning our sins. So, when God justifies a sinner who repents, it's not that God excuses our sins it's, or he denies our sins, um, but he pardons our sins because of the full sufficient sacrifice that has been made for us. Okay, So we look at some truths about justification uh, just for us to uh, learn a little more about what justification is. So, you know, when we are justified, it means that God declares that we, that the penalty for sin has been paid, the penalty for our sins, that uh, sins that are committed in the past, sins that are committed in the present, sins that are committed in the future has already been uh, paid and the price has been paid by Jesus Christ. And we have the virtues of uh, the perfect righteousness before God. That means we stand perfectly righteous uh, before God. Why do we stand perfectly righteous before God? Or what do we mean by saying that, you know, um, uh, we are seen as perfectly righteous before God? Because of Jesus' sacrifice. Because of Jesus' sacrifice, yes, because Jesus' righteousness has been uh, imputed on us, okay? God declares us to be just, God declares us to be righteous because, not because of what we have done, it's not because of our merits, uh, it's because Christ's righteousness has been imputed on us. Us. What does it mean that Christ's righteousness has been imputed on us? Any thoughts, ideas on this? What do we mean by saying that Christ's righteousness has been imputed on us? It means that Christ, uh, you know, uh, God thinks because of Christ's righteousness, uh, God thinks of Christ's righteousness as belonging to us. So when we say that God imputes Christ's righteousness on us, it means that God thinks of Christ's righteousness as belong as something that belongs to us, or regards it as belonging to us, or He reckons it to our account. Now, what is the meaning of reckon? to our account, or what does it mean he reckons? Uh, we read this when uh, we look at Abraham's life. It says, Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. So what does reckon mean? Reckon basically means something that is accounted, 
uh, something that is counted, something that is imputed. Uh, it basically means, you know, put down into one's account. Okay, so it's like Christ's righteousness has been put into my account. Christ's righteousness has been uh, put into each one of our uh, accounts, and it is there. Um, and you can take it to be as if uh, as it is there in your account, uh, and it is something that can be counted as a fact. So we are considered as righteous uh, in God's sight, not because we have taken that step of um, you know of um, uh, asking him for forgiveness um, and uh, you know asking um, you know uh, acknowledging that we are sinners uh, repenting of our sins asking him for forgiveness and asking Jesus to come into our lives sometimes uh, we can have this kind of a spiritual pride or salvation pride you know it's like uh, others haven't accepted Jesus Christ but I was humble in uh, uh, humble enough to, you know, uh, to acknowledge that I'm a sinner when others consider themselves as not as that they, they don't sin, what they're doing is not wrong. But compared to them, I'm humble enough, you know, to ac accept the the fact that I'm a sinner. Uh, I'm humble enough to tell God that, uh, you know, I've sinned against him, I've broken his heart, I'm humble enough to ask him to come into my life. And I'm trying my best, you know, to uh, live a life that is honoring and pleasing in his uh, sight. Now, we can kind of take spiritual pride in that, but I hope if you are, uh, you know, following through the lessons uh, very attentively, you you can you would have uh, noticed or acknowledged the fact that there is nothing about us that we can really uh, say it's uh, it's about uh, us that has uh, kind of brought about. Uh, you know, God's grace or favor or his righteousness, his justification or his redemption in our life. It's basically God's grace, his mercy. It's a gift. Uh, of course, it's a, it's a two-way process. You know, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. But it also says that whoever believes in him, uh, you know, should, will, shall not perish. So it's, uh, it's something that God has done, but we need to acknowledge it. But let's not uh, take pride in that, because if you look at it, you know, it's none of our merits. It's just God's gift. Uh, and we are considered righteous in God's sight because Christ's righteousness has been imputed or it has. Uh, we are reckoned righteous before God because of Christ's righteousness. That means we are clothed in Christ's righteousness. Uh, Christ's righteousness has been uh, put into our account. Um, and we have that in our account, and that's why God looks as, as, at us as if we are uh, righteous, okay? So let's count it as a fact that, uh, you know, we have been made righteous. It's because uh, God sees uh, Christ's righteousness as belonging to us or regards it as something that uh, has been uh, reckoned into, uh, 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 you know, or put into our account, Okay. The next truth about justification is the fourth one is that justification comes entirely by God's grace. And as I said, it's not anything that uh, uh, can be said because it's our merit or it's in ourselves, but it's uh, entirely God's grace. Can one of you please read Romans chapter 3, uh, verses 20 to 24, please? Romans 3, 20 to 24. And somebody else can open up to Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. So uh, as Rosalind reads uh, Romans 3, 20 to 24, someone else can open to Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. Yes, Rosalind, would you like to read Romans 3, 20 yes. to 24? Yes. Romans 3, 22. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Thank you. So we see that, uh, you know, all of us have sinned, 
fallen short of the glory of God, but we are justified uh, freely uh, by God's grace uh, that is through Jesus Christ. Thank you, Rosalind. Uh, can one of you please read Galatians chapter 2, verse 16, please? Galatians 2, 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Christ Jesus, even that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Mm -hmm. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. Thank you. Uh, we cannot be justified by keeping uh, the law, the keeping the commandments, because no one can be justified by just keeping the law. But it is through faith in Christ uh, Jesus. And this is something that uh, was a constant, uh, that's something that Paul constantly reminded uh, the early church even as he writes uh, letters to the church at Corinth, Rome, uh, church at Ephesus, Crete, he's constantly reminding them it's because of uh, this uh, Jewish uh, converts who come from the Jewish faith into Christianity, still bring in these rules and regulations, um, you know, of circumcision and keeping other rituals and bring in um, their um, Jewish fables and myths and genealogies, uh, stories which, um, uh, you know, a kind of Jewish tradition holds, but is not in the canon, is not in the scripture, so to say. And they were trying to propagate that or trying to teach that to uh, the Gentile believers saying that they need to adhere to all of this, um, uh, you know, for their works of salvation. So Paul was continually reminding uh, the churches that it's not by keeping the law, uh, it's not by works, but uh, just we are justified uh, by faith in Christ Jesus. And it's a free gift and it's not by keeping the a law. So he talks about that in Galatians, in Timothy, his letters to Timothy, and also in his uh, uh, his book to the church at uh, Rome. Uh, Romans, uh, if you look at Romans chapter six, seven, uh, talks about uh, uh, about the law and about sin. Okay, so we are justified by faith in Christ Jesus, and. Um, we know that even um, you know, the faith that requires us for salvation is not something that is natural, but it's also God-given uh, faith. Okay. So what are some of the practical implications of justification? Um, since justification is a free gift and we receive it only by faith in Christ Jesus and what he has accomplished on the cross, um, it kind of offers a hope, a genuine hope, uh, for unbelievers, it also uh, for so that they can, you know, uh, come to a place where they can accept the love of God, the sacrifice of God, and this free gift that is freely available. Because if you look at the other so-called religions, you know, everything salvation is by works. They have to do things, but uh, you know, Christ has made it freely available for us. It's just by putting our faith in the complete, uh, uh, completed work, in the completed sacrifice of Jesus, and we receive it by uh, faith, okay? And uh, another practical implication is that we can have absolute confidence uh, before God, or we have absolute confidence in God, uh, because he will never uh, make us pay for the penalty for our sins. So when we talk about paying the penalty for our sins, it's basically death, right? The wages of sin is death, like we read in Romans. Uh, so, you know, um, we'll have this assurance that, you know, we will never pay the penalty for death. That means we will enjoy eternal life right here now. It is not something that is an, uh, just an eschatological hope. That means something way in the future where we will experience eternal life in heaven. Uh, but it is a realized eschatology. Uh, salvation is a realized eschatology. Uh, eternal life is a realized eschatology. That means it is something that we realize now in the present, even though it is something way in the future, that we will see its complete uh, fulfillment, complete picture, complete glory. But it's something that we can realize here now in the present. So we enjoy eternal life. We enjoy the benefits of salvation here and now. And we have this assurance that uh, we will never taste uh, eternal death. 
but we will uh, enjoy eternal salvation and we can have this absolute confidence in God when we accept him as our personal savior, that we have uh, been redeemed, that we have been uh, justified. God looks at us, at us as if we have never sinned, we are forgiven, completely forgiven, and uh, Christ's righteousness has been imputed on us, reckoned to us, and uh, we stand righteous because Christ's righteousness covers us, it clothes us, and God looks at us uh, as uh, we are righteous and justified in his uh, presence. Okay, so this is about justification. Anyone has any uh, questions, any doubts, anything that you would like to share? Any thoughts? No? Okay, if there are no thoughts or questions or queries, we'll uh, look at the doctrine of sanctification. Uh, so what does sanctification mean? What does the term sanctification mean? Uh, it's a progressive work of God, which makes a person more, more, uh, more Christ-like. Thank you, Zlatoli. It's a progressive work of God, uh, which makes a person more Christ-like. Yes, Abu Bakr? Sanctification is a spiritual processing through God in which all believers um, become more like Christ. Thank you. Uh, it's a work of God through, uh, uh, and it's a process and uh, through which um, uh, a believer uh, becomes more like Christ. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, so sanctification is a progressive work. What does it mean by, uh, wh what do we mean by saying it's a progressive work? Yes, it's a continuous process, continuous something. Thank you, Isaac. It's something that is continuous. Um, you know, um, uh, it, it happens throughout our life. We are redeemed once for all. We are justified made righteous in God's sight once for all. It's an instantaneous act, but sanctification is something that begins the moment we ask Jesus uh, uh, to be the Lord and Savior of our life, but then it's uh, something that continues um, uh, throughout our life, and, um, you know, uh, uh, it's the work of God, and it is something that requires even our, uh, our uh, cooperation. Uh, so it's something that happens throughout our life. It's a progressive work of God and man. Okay, so it uh, requires our support. It requires our cooperation. So when I say that it requires our support, it requires our cooperation, what do I mean? We need to ask God to sanctify us, to cleanse us. Thank you, uh, Rosalind. So, um, yes, Lubega. I think, ma'am, it it needs much as God is more powerful, that uh, is the most powerful being that does not need our support. But on this one, since God gave us a power of choice, as we are living in this world, after we've been justified by Christ, we still live in a human body, whereby we should keep on do doing the right decisions that are Jesus-like, so that we continue in our process uh, of, of uh, salvation, as we see, as it is written in James, that are uh, Faith without works would be dead. So we won't say that since we were justified, we continue living a sinful life, doing everything because we think it was finished on the cross. But we should keep doing things that we think are morally right as far as Christ lived in this world. 
That's my sub submission, Pastor. Thank you, Lubega. So yes, God is sovereign, uh, but in his sovereignty, he has given us a free will to choose. Uh, we have chosen salvation, uh, but we also need to make uh, uh, the everyday choice, every moment choice to consecrate our lives, to choose to make choices according to God's will that pleases him. Um, we need to, so, uh, you know, so to say, lay our lives at the altar every day where we are consecrating, dedicating, uh, and uh, resubmitting our lives, our areas of our life, because when we are born again, we are born, made new in our spirit man, but um, our mind and our uh, bodies, uh, you know, uh, still have the same old cravings uh, uh, and tendency to tend towards uh, uh, sin, um, uh, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And so we need, um, you know, God to uh, work in us and uh, the extent that we allow the Holy Spirit to sanctify us, to that extent he will sanctify us. So if we, you know, say, God, I consecrate this area of my life, but, you know, in another area, we, when it uh, comes to, uh, when it comes to our, um, you know, the way we speak, uh, you know, no control over our, uh, uh, our tongue, what we speak, what we say, then, uh, you know, or maybe in another area, we are in our thoughts, we are maybe pure and clean, or maybe we don't watch anything that is displeasing or dishonoring in God's sight. Uh, but we see that certain areas we have uh, allowed the Holy Spirit to sanctify us, but there are certain areas we still need to allow him, like, you know, uh, the area of uh, how we use our tongues, the way we speak, um, you know, so uh, we need to consecrate every part of us, our whole being, um, uh, so that it can be made holy, righteous in God's um, sight. Uh, so, yes, it's a progressive work of God, and it requires our co uh, cooperation to the extent that we allow the Holy Spirit to sanctify us. To that extent, he will uh, sanctify us, and, um, you know, he will free us from sin. He will make our lives just like Christ, so in our thoughts, in our motives, in our actions, in our reactions in our attitudes, in our behaviors, we will tend to be more Christ-like, okay? Uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14 says, For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. So you see here that, you know, the perfection forever happens only to those who are being sanctified. It's a continuous process, being, not those who are sanctified, but it says being sanctified. So this, uh, this phrase, he perfected forever those who are being sanctified, makes it plain that the work of Jesus is effective only for those who are being sanctified, those who are consecrated themselves, every part of themselves. And the work of Jesus is capable of saving every human being, but the work of sanctification is only effective in those who are being sanctified. That means who are, you know, setting apart uh, the members of their body or the faculties of their body, every part of their being, uh, you know, to God. Okay, there are three stages of sanctification. Uh, sanctification has a definite beginning. Uh, it that means it begins when a person is born again. Um, and, um, you know, uh, when we are born again, um, the power of sin in our bodies is broken and we no longer can continue to love sin. Uh, can one of you please read 1 John chapter 3 verse 9, please? 1 John chapter 3 verse 9. So sanctification happens when a person is born again. And when we are born again, the power to sin is broken. Uh, we no longer can continue to love sin or, uh, you know, continue to give into our own sinful habits. Uh, 1 John chapter 3 verse 9. Can one of you read, please? Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him. And he cannot sin because he has been born of God. Thank you. So if you're born of God, then, uh, you know, you cannot sin. Okay. The second thing is a stage of sanctification is that sanctification increases throughout our life. Okay. 
um, it happens uh, throughout um, our journey in life. The moment we accept Christ till the day we die, uh, we are set free from sin. We are dead to sin. Um, at the same time, you know, uh, we should not present our members of our body to sin um, and so that we do not become slaves of sin again, but we have to yield to God as uh, it's uh, given in Romans chapter 6. In Romans chapter 6, it basically talks about um, you know, uh, talks about sin and not presenting our uh, members of our body to sin. And Paul there, writing to the church at Rome, presents five action points that we must take uh, to live a life free of sin. In verse 11, he says, you know, reckon yourselves free from sin. That means Christ's righteousness has been put into our account. That means you just reckon for yourself that, you know, uh, you are no longer, uh, you know, uh, belonging to sin or the account of sin is not there in your members anymore. Uh, verse 12, he says, do not let sin reign in your bodies. Uh, in verse 13, uh, Paul says, do not present your bodies as instruments to righteousness. And he goes on to say in verse 13, but present yourselves to uh, God. And uh, he says uh, in the same verse, verse 13, present your members of your body as instruments of righteousness. Okay. Um, and um, he says, you know, the law is not um, able to keep you from sinning because uh, the law does not uh, strengthen you or support you uh, not to sin. The law only makes you aware of sin, that you have missed the mark, that you have fallen short of God's standard. But then Paul goes on to write in Romans chapter 8, he says, with the help of the Holy Spirit, uh, and not by our own efforts, we will be able to, you know, keep the law, we'll be able to keep the commandments, we'll be able to overcome the desires of the flesh, and we will be able to please um, uh, and offer our bodies as instruments of righteousness that, are, that is wholly pleasing in God's sight, because the Holy Spirit will empower us, okay? So please take time to read uh, Romans chapter uh, 6 this weekend. Uh, it basically says that, you know, we shouldn't present our members of our body to sin or be, because when we do that, we become slaves of sin again, but we have to yield to um, God, okay? Um, and Paul also writes in Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, he says, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to the things which are uh, ahead, Okay, so we need to look ahead um, and do things that are pleasing in God's sight. Colossians chapter 3 verse 10 says, And have put on, since we have put on the new man who is renewed in the knowledge according to the image of him who created uh, him. Okay, uh, so let's uh, renew ourselves every day, mind, soul, spirit, uh, body, um, uh, so that we can um, be sanctified and be like Jesus. Okay, so that is the, the second um, stage of sanctification that it increases throughout our life. The third thing is that sanctification is completed when uh, the Lord returns or when we go to be with the, the Lord. Uh, Philippians chapter 3 verses 20 and 21 says, uh, For our citizenship is in heaven uh, and we eagerly wait for the Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. Um, okay, and 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 23 and 49 says, But each one uh, in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are in Christ at his coming. Okay, so we are waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ uh, when we will go to be with him, and when uh, that's when our sanctification will be, the work of sanctification in our lives will be uh, completed. Okay. Uh, so we see that sanctification is a process. It begins uh, when we uh, when we're born again. We accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Uh, the Lord Jesus is uh, the one who sanctifies us, as we read in First Corinthians chapter one, verse thirty. Uh, but it also uh, involves, uh, you know, our role in that. In that, it, it involves us being active, uh, active and a passive role that we have to play. So, what is the passive role? The passive role is we just trust God. 
we pray uh, and ask him to sanctify us um, and we yield to God's work of sanctification in us. So that is a passive role when we pray and ask him to sanctify us and we yield uh, to God's work of sanctification in us. The active part is or the active role that we need to take is, uh, you know, we need to put to death the deeds uh, of the flesh. Okay. Um, Romans chapter 8 verse 13. Can one of you please read Romans chapter 8 verse 13? One of you can turn to Romans chapter 12 verse 1, please. So can one of you please read Romans 8 13 and someone else can read Romans 12 1. Romans 8 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Yes, so we need to daily, minute by minute as well, hour by hour, put to death the deeds uh, of the flesh, not live uh, to uh, fulfill the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, but we need to live by the spirit. Uh, when we live by the spirit, we will put to death the deeds of the body. That means our carnal nature will get starved. You know, it will no longer, uh, you know, uh, kind of rise up uh, or uh, force us to give into its sinful, lustful passions because we are continuing to feed us uh, spirit-filled nature. Okay, Romans 12, 1. Can one of you please read that, please? Romans 12, 1. Romans I beseech you, therefore, brethren. Therefore. Go ahead, by Aduban. the mercies of God, that you sent your body a living sacrifice, only acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Thank you. What is our reasonable service? What is our reasonable worship to God? Uh, it's offering or presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice holy, pleasing, and acceptable to God, okay? So only when uh, we are allowing the Holy Spirit to work in our lives to sanctify us can we present our bodies as a living, uh, holy sacrifice which is pleasing and acceptable in God's sight, okay? And then we need to also, what is our active role? We need to work out our salvation. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. Can one of you read that, please? Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. Rosalind, would you? Okay, go ahead, John. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For Thank it is God who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Thank you. Uh, so here we see that we need to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. So even salvation is not just something that happens the moment we ask, but uh, Jesus to, you know, be the Lord and Savior of our lives. But we need to work out our salvation daily, uh, you know, with fear and uh, trembling. That means uh, with respect, honoring God, um, you know, for what he has done. Uh, and honoring him uh, with uh, the choices that we make and how we live our um, lives, okay? So therefore, we need to continually build up a pattern and have uh, habits of holiness, okay? Before we close, we'll just look at uh, the differences between justification and sanctification. Uh, justification is our legal standing. That means it's our position, uh, the position of man before God. Uh, sanctification is our internal condition of man. You know, whether we are living holy, uh, upright lives, uh, consecrated lives before God. Justification, it happens once for all. The moment we ask Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of our lives, it happens that very moment, happens once for all, for all time. But sanctification, we know, is a continuous process. It happens throughout our lives. Justification is entirely God's word. Uh, we know we, we learned that it's a gift of God. It's not by anything that we do or uh, not by our good works, our merits, nothing. It's entirely God's work. It's his gift to us. 
but sanctification is something that we cooperate with God. The extent that we cooperate, we allow him, to that extent we will be sanctified. Justification is when we are made perfect in this life. A sanctification is when we need to be changed more into his uh, likeness. Justification is the same for all Christians, but uh, sanctification uh, is, you know, to the extent we are submitting, consecrating, laying our lives at the altar to that extent. So it's greater in some because they are consecrating their lives more, um, they're uh, consecrating the members of their bodies more to God, every area of their lives. And for some, it's less because there's some parts where God is in control, some parts they are in control of their lives. They are riding their cars. They are in the driver's seat. They are uh, moving it uh, forward. So to the extent that we allow is the extent that the sanctification happens and it's greater in some and lesser in the others. Okay. So that is about uh, justification and sanctification. Uh, any questions? Anyone has any questions? Any doubts? Yes, I, I have a problem, but not with the uh, doctrinal foundation, with the assignment on Christology. Yes. I had the same problem with uh, Rosalind. Uh, on the section I see on the assignment that is missing. So I set the classroom. Uh, Don't message. worry, Isaac. I've uh, I, I responded to your uh, message. I said we have received it, and I, I oh. have your assignment. Yes, I have your assessment. Oh. Okay, God bless yeah. you, ma. God bless you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Okay, if there's no questions, uh, no doubts, maybe you can take it in the next class. You can go through your notes, and uh, when we meet on Wednesday, we can clear your doubts and questions if you have any. Uh, so have a good uh, weekend. Have a blessed, refreshing weekend, and I'll see you all on uh, Monday. Okay? Bye, everyone.